In lecture four, we look at data description for a single variable. In the previous lecture, we looked at different data properties. Now that we have the data, we will begin to explore it or analyze it. And this data will be subsequently used in the hypothesis testing. For this lecture, we're going to consider a single variable. And in the following lecture, we consider two or more variables. The two main ways that are used to analyze our data are graphical methods and numerical methods. The type of graphical or numerical method we use will ultimately depend on the type of data that we're dealing with. And as we saw in a previous lecture, the two main types of data are qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative are names, whereas quantitative are numerical. Let us first look at the numerical methods used to describe qualitative data. So as qualitative data isn't numerical, it's names, we can calculate quantities such as the mean and the standard deviation, but we can divide it up into categories. Then we can count up the number of data points that fall into each of these categories, and this is the frequency. Now, a typical way to look at qualitative data is to represent it in a frequency table. For example, in the table below, we have a sample of 60 people who were asked about their favorite car color. We can break car color up into different categories, red, blue, and so on. And then for our sample, we count up the number of people who have that particular favorite car color. So in the table, we have 15 people who like red, 23 like blue, and so on. We can then calculate things such as the relative frequency, which is just the particular frequency in a row divided by the total frequency or the total number of people in your sample. For example, in this first one, the frequency for the number of people who like red is 15 over the total frequency, which is 60. And that is equal to 0 0.25. Or we can write that as a fraction as 1 over 4, or equivalently, as a percentage, 25%. And we can do that for each of the various categories. And the total frequency at the end should be 100% or 1. A nice feature of the frequency table is it is easy to pick out, say, where the highest and lowest frequency are. We can easily read off the highest frequency here of 38.3%. So most people in this sample like blues cars. Now this may be fairly obvious, but let's say you have a raw data set where you just have a list of values, you would have to count up those numbers individually. Whereas having a frequency table here, you can read it off quite straightforward. There are many different graphical methods that can be used to represent qualitative data. So I'm just gonna present the two most common ones here, namely a bar chart on the left and a pie chart on the right. Now using the data from the previous slide, that of 60 people in their favorite car color, we can represent that data in a bar chart where each bar represents a category and the height of each bar represents the associated frequency. So for example, here we can see that 15 people like red cars, 10 people like green cars. It's a similar idea with the pie chart where we can see the fraction or relative frequency of people that like um, particular cars. So for example, here, this represents a quarter of the circle, and that is 25%, or in the case of its status set, 15 people. What's nice about these graphical methods is they give you a very quick snapshot of what is happening with the data. Next, we'll discuss some of the graphical methods available to look at quantitative data. So as we've stated already, quantitative data is numerical values. And there are lots of different graphs that can be used to represent quantitative data. So I'm just going to present two of the more popular ones here, namely a histogram, which is shown below on the left, and a box plot, which is shown over on the right. We will briefly look at the histogram on the left hand side. This histogram describes height of students. So like with the bar chart, we have different categories, but this time the numerical. So for example, this 
bar here represents 160 to 165 centimeters. The height represents the frequency or number of students that lie in that category, which is 20. Now on the right, we have a box plot and it's not for it, any particular data, so it's just a general box plot. So with the box plot, what's nice about it is it's also known as a five point summary. It's got five key statistical measures that are used to make up the uh, box plot. And if we look at them, we have the median, which is the value that splits your data set in two, the first quartile and the third quartile. Now the first quartile, you can think of that as the median of the first half of your data set, or if you take the entire data set, it's the, data, it's the point that lies a quarter of a way into your data set. The third quartile then is the value that is a third of the way into your data set. And the other two values are the min and max of your data set. The box that makes up the box plot, that represents the middle 50% of your data. So the, the percentage of data between Q1 and Q3. This value here, the interquartile range, that's the, the span of that middle 50% and it goes from Q3 to Q1. Another key feature of box plots are the whiskers. These vertical lines outside the main box. Now these are calculated in this case using the formula for the lower whisker Q1, so the first quartile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, and the upper whisker is Q3 plus 1.5 multiplied by the interquartile range. So why these are important are they're used to identify outliers. So outliers are very small values on the left-hand side or very large values that are a bit unusual in that they are much smaller or much larger than the rest of your data set. Now in this case, because we're using 1.5 in our formula to find those whiskers, they are, these are what are called mild outliers. We also have a formula for extreme outliers. And if we're using that version of the formula, we just change the 1.5 to 3. One final feature in the box plot, and this feature doesn't appear in all of them, are these reference lines. And these reference lines are just vertical lines that are used to indicate a specific value, such as a particular percentile. Like the first quartile is the 25th percentile, the median is the 50th percentile. But for some reason, depending on your study, you might want to indicate the 80th percentile, the 90th percentile. They may also be used to indicate some other statistical measure. And they just provide additional context for interpreting the data. Now, one last thing about these histograms and box plots is they're very important in terms of informing you about the data distribution. Okay, think of the data distribution just to shape your data set. I'm going to spend a bit of time looking at the different types of distributions because the type of distribution is going to inform the type of analysis that you ultimately end up using. You can think of the data distribution as just the graphical representation of your data. Now, two of the most important distributions that you see in practice are that of symmetric or bell shaped distributions or asymmetric right or left skewed distributions. We can look at these distributions in relation to histograms and BART or box plots below. Firstly, we have a symmetric distribution. That's where your data distribution in the context of a histogram takes on this approximately symmetric or bell-shaped curve. You have the median in the middle and the first quartile and third quartile are approximately equidistant from the median. And we can see that also in the box plot below. We have this symmetric distribution with the box right in the middle and the whiskers are approximately the same distance away from the median set. Now, the second two graphs are skewed. Okay, firstly, we have right skew or positive skew. Now, the skew is the flat part of the curve, so that's why it's a right skew. What that means in terms of your data is that the majority of your data is, say, small, and over here on the left in the histogram, over here in the uh, box plot, but there are some values that are large, 
and that's what drags the distribution or skews it over to the right. We have the same ID with a left skewed or negative skewed distribution. In this case, most of the values are over here on the right, as indicated by the high bars in the histogram, but there are some smaller values that drag the distribution over to the left-hand side of the histogram. Same ID with the box plot below. Most of the values are here on the right, but there are some values that are smaller that drag the distribution over to the left. Now these symmetric and skewed distributions come up a lot in practice, but that's not the only examples, okay? We also have a uniform distribution. Now this is an example of an approximate uniform distribution. In this case, the bars of our histogram are all approximately the same height, okay? We have a bimodal distribution. So this has, say, two peaks. And I actually encountered an example like this a few years ago in an assessment where we, have, we had students scoring very low. So that would be down here. And the other half of the class scoring very high. We can also have a multimodal example. That's where we have three peaks. Now, just going back to this second one here as well, this vital model is also an example of a symmetric distribution. Imagine if you had a line going down through the middle. It doesn't fold approximately symmetrically over that line perfectly, but it's approximately symmetric. Now, when I mention symmetric dis data distributions, I have to mention the normal distribution. It's an example of a symmetric distribution which comes up a lot in practice. So, the normal distribution takes on this classic symmetric bell-shaped curve where we have the mean, the median, and mode going down through the middle of our distribution. The mean is the all the data points added up divided by the number of them. The median is the middle number in an ordered data set, and the mode is the most frequent number that occurs in your data set. So it's symmetric about this uh, point of the mean, the median, and the mode where 50% lies to the left of it and 50% lies to the right. Now on the graph on the right, I want to highlight two key values that are associated with the normal distribution. And that is of the mean, which is given the symbol mu, and it indicates where the center of your data set is. And this Greek symbol here, sigma, which represents the standard deviation, which indicates how spread out your data set is. The larger sigma is, the more spread out your data set is around the central value of the mean. Now we look at some numerical methods for quantitative data. Firstly, we have the measures of centrality, which indicate the center of your data set. The three most common values are the mode, the mean, and the median. Next, we have measures of variation or spread of your data. And the three most common ones there are the range, standard deviation interquartile range. Graphically, you can think of measures of variation looking at the image on the right below. If you have a data set where the values are all compact or tightly close around the mean, you will have a narrow distribution and it has this shape like in red. Whereas if you have a large spread of data, you have this broad distribution associated with your data set. One should also consider the characteristics of the distribution, namely normality. So does your data set take on that normal shape? Modality, so how many peaks are there in your data set? And if your data set contains any outliers, so that's data that's, say, significantly different from the overall distribution, so very large or very small values. The shape of your data distribution is going to tell you which measures of centrality and variation should use. For example, in the case of a symmetric distribution where the mode, the mean, and the median are approximately equal, you're going to use the mean and standard deviation as your measures of centrality and variation. Even though the mean is approximately equal to the median, so you could argue that you can use both, the reason you use the mean is, first of all, the mean is used in a lot of hypothesis testing, much more so than the median. So that's one reason to use it. 
But the other reason is we can write down an explicit formula for the mean, and that is the sum of the values over the number of them, where the median does, have an, does not have an explicit formula. It has a set of steps. You order the numbers, smallest to biggest, and then you pick out the number in the middle. So this can be used, the mean can be used in more advanced analysis. Say you want to find the derivative of the mean. Okay, you can't do that with the median. We also then use the standard deviation because the mean is used in the formula for the standard deviation. Now, in the case of skewed data, whether it's skewed left or skewed right, we use the median and our interquartile range as our measures of centrality and variation. If we consider the median, the reason the median is used as opposed to, say, the mean, if we're dealing with a skewed data set, if you take the example above here on the left, if you have very small values in your data set, that's going to skew the mean. It's going to drag it over to the left or make it smaller, whereas the median is not impacted as much by the smaller values because you're still just ordering the numbers, the number as small as the biggest, and picking out the number in the middle. So it is a much better, much better measure of centrality as opposed to the mean with skewed data. It's a similar idea with the interquartile range, where the interquartile range is the first, the third quartile minus the first quartile. Finally, I want to close on this normal distribution checklist. So you have a data set and you want to check if it's normally distributed. Because if it's normally distributed, there's a lot of different type of analysis you can do with it. Firstly, you have visual inspection. So by looking at a histogram and box plot of your data, you can do it by eye. If they both look approximately symmetric, you can use, you can assume it's normally distributed. We also have what's called a QQ plot, and I have an example here on the bottom right. A QQ plot compares quantiles of the observed data set against quantiles of a theoretical distribution, namely the normal distribution in this case. Now, if your data set is normally distributed, the points in the graph, they should follow, lie on the straight line. Now, in this case, we have a fraction of the points not on the line. These represent outliers. And if you have outliers in your data set, it may mean your data set is skewed, so which would indicate that it's not normally distributed. Next, we can also look at the mean and the median. And if they're approximately equal, they may not always be exactly equal, but if they're approximately equal, you can conclude that your data set is normal, like in this simple example up here. Another measure is this value skewness. Now, there are lots of different formula for calculating skewness. But in general, the idea here is you have some upper and lower limits, in this case, minus one and plus one. And if your value of skewness lies between the two of those, you conclude that your data set is normally distributed. These values of minus one and plus one are just general numbers I've picked here. They'll depend on the context that you're looking at. And finally, we have a Shapiro wheel test for normality, which is a hypothesis test that can be run in any statistical software to check if your data set is normal or not. So that concludes this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to look at some more data description, but for two variables or more.